Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Lucy and in today's video I'm delighted to continue my A Beginner's Guide series and this video is A Beginner's Guide to Jane Austen. I've been an Austenite, a Jane Austen fangirl since I was about 14 years old, 13 years old maybe. I was reading a very battered old copy of Pride and Prejudice and I remember not being able to fall asleep because I was so engrossed in Pride and Prejudice. And from that age onwards, every single Christmas, every birthday, I asked for a Jane Austen book. I would ask for all of the editions I didn't have and my collection grew from there. So this video is going to be for complete beginners to Jane Austen or for people who have maybe read one or two of Jane Austen's books and you want to know what books to continue with next or where to go for further reading. But this video of course can be enjoyed by Jane Austen addicts as well and I really hope to see a few of you guys in the comments below. So in terms of the structure of this video, like my other A Beginner's Guide to videos, we're going to talk a little bit more about the context at the start, the introduction, who is Jane Austen? You know, what is she known for? What are the tropes used in her works? And then we will go on to the book recommendations where I will talk through each of Jane Austen's novels and also give you some further reading to continue with your Jane Austen obsession. So to kick us off, who is Jane Austen? When was she alive? Who was she? So Jane Austen was born in England on the 16th of December, 1775. She was born in a little parish called Steventon in Hampshire and her father, George, was the rector of the Anglican parishes around Steventon. So interestingly, her father, George, came from a very kind of wealthy background. So his background, his family kind of history was that they were wool merchants and they actually had money in their past. However, as this kind of filtered down the generations, that money became less prominent and George was a, he was a basically a rector. He was part of the church. He wasn't very, very wealthy and that made life as an Austin quite difficult. They were quite poor. However, what was always prominent in the Austen household was the focus on intellect, on reading, on being open and humorous. Humour was a big thing in the Austen household and a lot of critics say this is really where Jane got her kind of lust for life, her kind of joy and finding the humour in a lot of things from her family dynamic. So Jane was actually one of eight children in the Austen household. She was one of the younger children actually. But Jane in particular was closest to a few members of her siblings. Henry, who was one of her older brothers, he really became a champion of her work and really, really pushed it into the hands of publishers. He was basically her literary agent and they had a great, great dynamic. But also, as is probably better known, Jane was very, very close to her sister Cassandra and her and Cassandra's relationship is just one of those like iconic literary friendships and family relationships because Cassandra impacted so much of her work and usually Cassandra was one of the first people that Jane would read her work to. What was clear though was that in Jane's early life her family dynamic was one of a very open and intellectual discussion where they often had political disagreements but they felt comfortable enough and they were close enough to kind of have debates and have discussions which I think really stimulated Jane's creative mind and Jane was always scribbling something from an early age. Jane was a writer from the get-go and she has written a lot of letters, a lot of plays, a lot of very like kind of comic um, writings before she started writing her established novels. So Jane lived in Steventon for most of her life and then she actually moved when her father retired from the rectory position. They actually moved to Bath and Bath was a time in Jane's life that is kind of up for discussion because Jane commented that she did not like life in Bath. A lot of critics say that this is when in terms of her creative work that side of things really suffered. She was only really editing novels at this time. She wasn't actively writing novels. So in terms of like what we know from her creative output, Bath was like a very kind of not a great time in her life. You know, she didn't really enjoy living there. However, some critics say this might have just been because in Bath, which was a huge, huge part of society at the time, in Regency society, Bath was 
very well to do there were lots of balls you know society was there so jane would have been very very busy with societal parties and events and seeing her friends and family you know she was just probably quite busy and that's why some scholars actually say you know it wasn't that her creativity suffered it was just that she didn't have time to write a novel after her stay in bath jane's father died i believe and when her father died Jane actually moved to Chawton House, which was part of a estate that her brother actually owned and was part, you know, he kind of married into wealth, I believe. So his, her brother was very well to do. And he basically allowed Jane, her mother, and I believe Cassandra to move into Chawton, which is one of the little cottages on this big estate and to have a very kind of like secluded life in the country there. And Jane really loved life there. You know, I think she was very much suited for country life, like, you know, I can relate to for sure. Um, but then when Jane's health started to decline, she actually moved to Winchester and she spent her final days in Winchester. Jane died of what is thought to be Addison's disease. This is up for debate because a lot of scholars say it was Addison's disease. Some think it was a kind of Hodgkin's lymphoma situation. Anyway, Jane did die at the age of 41. In 1817, she is now buried at Winchester Cathedral. So Jane died quite young, I think. I think, you know, she died with a lot of unfinished work, which if she hadn't have died, like who knows how great they would be. Her closeness with her sister and her family, you know, that was the main relationship in her life. She actually did not have any significant romantic relationships apart from a broken engagement she basically agreed to marry a very very wealthy kind of family friend she agreed to marry him and then the next day she actually broke off the engagement because she knew that she didn't like him she didn't love him and that was very very clear if jane was going to get married she was going to marry with affection she did not want to enter into a relationship or a marriage that didn't have affection or admiration of some kind and i think that is something to remember when you're reading jane austen's works that is what shines through the entire novel so let me get on to the next section which is the themes and the tropes and the kind of more like critical analysis of her works what is important to note when you are starting off reading austen or if you you know maybe you've read a few austens and you didn't really get them, maybe you didn't really get what the hype was about. What is important to know when reading Jane Austen is Jane loved parody. Austen really favoured humour. She liked taking the mick out of things. And so Jane's novels often are parodying the sentimental novel genre. So novels of sentiment were really, really big at this time. Another kind of tradition which was rife at this time was romanticism. So think of the romantic poets like, you know, Byron, Shelley and Keats. You know, romanticism, that over-consuming passion, that, you know, transcendental emotions which guided romantic poetry and sentimental novels at the time jane really sought to parody these and you will see that a lot in her novels where there is a very wry and very funny look at society jane interprets and critiques the landed gentry of regency society in a very kind of wry and on the nose way and she always seeks to do this so i think that's something to bear in mind i think it's very very apparent in something like pride and prejudice where you just see her kind of have fun with how the class system works the landed gentry jane's works also explore the dependence of marriage especially in terms of women's dependence on marriage and how sometimes women have to get married and jane often uses techniques like irony social commentary and just humor in general the novels are always fun and there's always something to laugh at her characters are always laughing especially elizabeth bennett like elizabeth loves to laugh and she says that often you know she doesn't take anything too seriously and i think that is the beauty of jane's work equally all of jane's protagonists marry for love you know that is something that is kind of common throughout all of her books is that they find the person that they love and that's so important because Jane really believed that. Jane actually advised her own niece, who was kind of having a similar situation, 
about when to get married and Jane advised her niece, you know, if you don't like him, then don't marry him. She said admiration is something you should marry for, not convenience and that was something she really believed and stuck to. So let's go through Jane's novels. So it is now the book portion of this video where I will talk about each of her novels in turn in published order. So let me start with Jane's first published novel, which was Sense and Sensibility. So Sense and Sensibility was published in 1811. And believe it or not, this was not the original title. When Jane wrote this, the original title was Eleanor and Marianne. I think I like Sense and Sensibility a lot more, I'm just saying. A lot of Jane's novels did have alternate titles when she was writing them and then on publication she changed them. So Sense and Sensibility is actually not one of my favourites, however this was the first proper novel that Jane wrote. And what is a common theme in some of Jane's earlier novels is big families and siblings. And Elna and Marianne's relationship is a really kind of interesting part of this book and one that was definitely influenced by Jane's own relationship with her sister Cassandra. So as this was Jane's first published novel, it was published anonymously and it just said that it was by a lady. And Sense and Sensibility explores the lives of two siblings, as I said, Elna and Marianne. And when they basically move to a very kind of small countryside abode, they basically both fall in love. And you can kind of guess by the title, one of them is all about sense and the other one is about sensibility, kind of that overtaking of emotions. Elna is very much the responsible one. She's always a bit hesitant about showing her emotions about falling in love but Marianne falls head over heels with a man called Willoughby who basically he's no good and this is a classic example of Jane critiquing the novels of sensibility at the time. I definitely need to reread this book because I have just done this dirty I think. I think I've not given this enough attention and honestly this is a lot of people's favourite Jane Austen books and the film adaption with Kate Winslet and Emma Thompson is incredible, really would recommend that. We are moving on to my all-time favourite Jane Austen novel, Pride and Prejudice. So this is perhaps Jane Austen's most loved most famous novel for sure. So Pride and Prejudice was published in 1813 and this was originally called First Impressions. So Pride and Prejudice, as I'm sure you all know, focuses on our heroine Elizabeth Bennet and Lizzie is my favourite all-time character. Like, I love her. She is just a gem of a character and Lizzie basically lives with this slightly chaotic family her father and mother have a very odd dynamic. Her mother is a busybody. She wants to marry all of her children off because she has been burdened with five daughters. And her father is very kind of like practical and kind of just wants a quiet life. He doesn't want any hassle. And sometimes this can come across as a bit kind of arrogant, a bit rude. Each of her family members have something quite rude about them. And, uh, quite intolerable, let's just say. Lizzie is very, very close to her sister Jane, who is the eldest of the five girls. Jane is the beauty of their kind of village and town and her beautiful looks have long been talked about. Basically, she is very, very eligible and all of her family know that. So when Jane catches the attention of Mr. Bingley, who has just moved to the area, basically it's all looking up for the family and Jane's mother, Mrs. Bennet, thinks, great, we're sorted. However, Lizzie is then introduced to Mr. Bingley's friend called Mr. Darcy. And let's just say, Mr. Darcy is very, very cold. He's very rude. He judges the society that he's in. You know, he is full of pride and he's full of like, just arrogance. And Lizzie really starts to dislike him. Then when he basically separates Mr. Bingley and Jane from each other, he persuades Mr. Bingley not to fall in love with Jane and to just separate himself from her. He breaks up what would be a happy union. Lizzie is like, just hates him. Hate. Of course it's Jane Austen, not everything is that easy. They are thrown together again and Pride and Prejudice is the perfect title for this novel because both characters have to see past their own pride and their own prejudice to see each other for who they actually are and maybe they will fall in love. So I love Pride and Prejudice, it's everything to me. It's influenced a lot of my reading tastes and 
I would not be here in publishing, working in publishing, you know, filming booktube videos if it wasn't for this book. So thank you, Pride and Prejudice. Okay, the next novel that was published by Jane Austen in her time was Mansfield Park. Mansfield Park was published in 1814 and I think it is one of Jane Austen's most underrated novels because even though this is a little bit chunkier than her other books, I think this is really accomplished and a really great novel. So this focuses on a character called Fanny who lives with her cousins and distant relations who are a lot wealthier than her but Fanny has been orphaned I believe and she is always in the shadow of these richer wealthier cousins of hers. And then when Henry Crawford and his sister Mary come to Mansfield Park to stay with Fanny and her family basically they cause a massive ruckus because they are very eligible the Crawfords and there may be relations between some of the Bertram family and the Crawfords and people end up falling in love with people they shouldn't. And the back of this book describes it as Jane Austen's most sophisticated love story and I think that that is very accurate actually because it is very developed, it's very thought out and I just really enjoyed Mansfield Park. It is not to be missed and if you're just starting out on your Jane Austen journey definitely pick this one up. Okay so next we are getting to Emma. This is one of Jane Austen's most beloved novels because the character of Emma is just She's a wild ride, let's just say that. Emma is just iconic. She is goals. And this book is just poking fun at social classes, especially characters like Emma, who is very, very frivolous. She just wants to meddle with people's lives. So Emma is about a girl called Emma Woodhouse who lives with her father. They are very, very well off. They're very wealthy. And her older sister has just gotten married, leaving her alone with her father in the house. So Emma is obviously kind of grieving her sister kind of moving on and leaving the family home. So instead Emma becomes very firm friends with a girl called Harriet and basically tries to match make her way around her village with all the tenants that are attached to this great house that she lives in. So Emma loves matchmaking people and she just you know wants to put people together and make them happy but Emma is very, very blindsided to a lot of, you know, people's wishes essentially. So she just kind of flies headstrong into an idea and she's just very, very silly about it. She often actually doesn't see what's in front of her nose, which is her own kind of stirring relationship with her brother-in-law called Mr. Knightley. Mr. Knightley, I, I just love him. Like, best part of the novel is Mr Knightley because he is just so pragmatic. He's a bit older than Emma so he's very much like the realist and he's like Emma you're being silly like what are you doing like matchmaking all these people. So he's kind of the grounding force to this whole novel. Let's just say Emma gets herself into some kind of foibles, some mistakes along the way, manages to upset a lot of people and has to basically put her matchmaking on hold and just be back in reality. So contextually what's interesting about this novel is it is dedicated to the Prince Regent. So Jane Austen's novels were beloved by the Prince Regent and he actually asked her to dedicate her next one to him. She was very reluctant to do this because she did not support the Prince Regent who was very very known for his kind of gambling, his drinking, his debauchery, his sleeping around basically causing havoc. He was a very very kind of divisive character but because he was the Prince Regent Jane could hardly say no to dedicating Emma to him. So you will find in your editions of Emma that there is a little dedication to the Prince Regent and I just like that little detail. I think it's quite fun. So that is Emma and that was the last novel that was published while Jane Austen was alive. So let's go on to the novels that were published posthumously after her death. The first one is Northern Garabi. I have kind of an interesting relationship with Northern Garabi. It's not my favourite. But what I can appreciate about Northern Garabi, which was published posthumously after her death in 1818, is that it is a satire of the gothic novel tradition. So gothic novels were really, really big at the time. And what Northern Garabi does, it kind of makes fun of that tradition. And the way it does this is that Catherine Morland, who is the protagonist of this novel, is obsessed with gothic novels. It's all she reads. She fills her head with ghosts and 
vampires and she's obsessed with the you know she just thinks that there are dark things all around her then when she goes to stay at north and garabi which is the house of henry tilney which she strikes up a friendship with he invites her to northern garabi and she sees dark things everywhere she sees kind of like evil in all of the nooks and crannies of northern garabi she just lets her imagination get the better of her and then she realizes what a fool she has been because she's pushed away henry tilney and you know that kind of potential for a relationship there it is a very funny novel i will give it that it is also one of jane austen's slimmest volumes it's a very short novel and hopefully i'll be rereading this one very very soon the final of jane austen's novels to be published posthumously is one of my all-time favorites it is persuasion persuasion is a beautiful beautiful novel this is described as her most mature novel. It is about a woman called Anne Elliot who when she is in her late teens, early 20s, she falls in love with a man called Wentworth and her family don't think he's good enough for her so her family basically tell her don't marry him, like you can do a lot better, like I know you love him but he's no good for you, you know, he is poor, he will never become anything, you need to just let this go. And Anne actually lets herself be persuaded, hence the title, by her family and she forgets and she rejects him and she tries to push away the love that she has for him. However, that love never ever goes away and then when her love becomes this very celebrated naval captain. He becomes Captain Wentworth. He rises up the ranks considerably. He is very kind of successful. He gets a lot of money and she's basically kicking herself. Like, look what he's become. He kind of becomes part of her social circles again. And that is when those feelings come back and she just regrets what she's given away. So I actually think this is one of the best written Jane Austen novels out there. Because it's written later in Jane's life, it's very mature. It is obviously about an older heroine who is looking back at a love that she let go of. So I would urge you all to read Persuasion. It's one of my favourites. Finally, to round off this video, I wanted to give you guys a few ideas of some further reading you could do if you've read all of Jane Austen's novels and you want your next hit of Austen. So first off, I wanna talk about some non-fiction. These are biographies, I guess. Um, so the first one is The Real Jane Austen by Paula Byrne. So this is Jane Austen's life in small things. So the things that she loved. Basically, each chapter begins with an object that Jane used and it meant a lot to Jane. And it kind of puts together a picture of her life through objects. So I think this book is really clever. I think it's really well done. I would really recommend it. And it's a different take on a biography, the fact that it is focused on the objects that Jane would have used day to day. The next one is a gorgeous book. It is Jane Austen at Home by Lucy Worsley. So this one is actually set around Jane Austen's homes, like the places where she lived, the places where she called home, and how that influenced her writing. I think this one is brilliant because as we know, where Jane Austen resided actually did impact a lot of her creativity. And as I mentioned earlier in this video about Bath, that was kind of a big kind of impact on her writing so this one especially is really interesting i love lucy wardley as a historian so you know this one's going to be good it's also one of the most beautiful books it's perfect it's an essential read if you're a jane austen addict the final biography i wanted to mention was the most kind of popular one i think by a very very popular and celebrated historian so this is Jane Austen, A Life, and this is by Claire Tomlin. This book is supposed to be one of the best biographies out there on Jane Austen. So if you are a Jane Austen addict, you want to know more about Jane Austen's life, or you're coming at Austen from a critical point of view, maybe you're studying her. This is an essential read for further reading on Jane Austen. This has been described as the essential biography on Jane. Finally, some fan fiction-esque books about Jane Austen. Obviously Jane Austen has spurred countless retellings and you know reimaginings, modern retellings of her works. Like I'm not going to go into all those. There are, they are countless so maybe I'll do another video on the kind of Jane Austen spin-offs. What I want to talk about though is the Pride and Prejudice variations. These are retellings of Pride and Prejudice with a kind of like saucier upgrade. 
So these are by Abigail Reynolds and these are variations on Pride and Prejudice. So basically Abigail Reynolds like fills in the gaps I guess and also kind of like imagines scenarios as if they would be different. Like what if they fell in love earlier? Loads of different variations and actually a lot of them you actually get to see the marriage between Darcy and Elizabeth. Some of them are like arranged marriage situations which I really like that trope. I like the kind of arranged marriage or marriage of convenience trope. So there are many many different tropes for these Pride and Prejudice variations. I will leave a link to some of them in the description bar so you can check them out for yourselves. Also Abigail Reynolds is one of the best kind of writers who are writing these like variations or Pride and Prejudice retellings or sequels. I have found that Abigail Reynolds' writing is the better out there and it really feels like you are reading an Austen book. So I would recommend those books if you want a continuation of the Pride and Prejudice story or perhaps just a little bit more spice to the Pride and Prejudice story. So guys, that is it for a beginner's guide to Jane Austen. Thank you so, so much for watching this video. If you did enjoy it, please do consider hitting that subscribe button and let me know down in the comments what is your favourite Jane Austen book? I would love to know. All of the books mentioned will be linked in the description bar so you can buy those if you're interested and I'll see you very very soon in my next video guys. Bye!